some of my favorite stories are ones that happen right after people get out of retreats. And one of them uh, that I've shared with some of you, a woman was having to travel and switch planes and she was exhausted. And so she, uh, was, she was tired, she was hungry, she got a some cookies, put them in her purse, sat down at a table, there was another man nearby, she also got a newspaper. Well, he was reading his newspaper and um, she took a cookie, ate it, then he did the same thing. <laughs> he reached into the bag and took a cookie, ate it, and she was um, very confused and <laughs> weirded out by that because she didn't know him, but she you know, didn't want to make a scene, so she just took another cookie and ate it and he did the same, and it kept going, and she was getting angrier and angrier until they, she took you know, a cookie and then there was just one more, and he broke it in half. <laughs> he gave her half, he ate the other half, and um, then he left. Well, sometime later, the, you know, the public announcement system called her to her gate, and much to her surprise, when she reached in to get her ticket, she found her bag of cookies. She had been eating his. <laughs> now, part of why I really like that story is because we so live in our narrative inside and in a story in our mind of what is actually happening. Now, we're not always reading reality quite as she did. But, you know, sometimes what's going on, our storyline has a useful representation of the world. Somebody is taking advantage of us, or somebody might be treating us in a way, disrespectful way, or something might be going on where it's completely appropriate for us to respond and draw boundaries and so on. And so often, and this is, you might remember Mark Twain's, fa one of his famous comments that the worst things in my life never actually happened. <laughs> yeah. So often we are moving through our day with a story about what is either wrong right now or what could go wrong. And if we're not totally conscious of that story, our body is kind of living in that mentality. So our inner story is based on fear beliefs that were developed very early. And for most of us, it's, you know, we have some difficult experiences with caregivers, with our environment, and we start believing how we can't trust certain things or how something's wrong with us. And then because our survival brain has a scan for what's wrong, we collect evidence and so we each collect evidence to kind of have some certainty. It gives us a sense of being on top of things, even if it's bad news, about what can go wrong and what is wrong. So we each, to different degrees, have some core beliefs that uh, have a reality that's limiting. And those beliefs are informing us today. They filter things. They filter how we are with other people. They filter what we perceive about other people. So you might think of how that can happen. Maybe, you know, you were in a family where you had an older sibling that was a bully, or a, a parent that was drinking and became a bully, or something like that. And then what happens? Well, we are around other people that might have some aggressiveness in their temperament and anticipate that they're going to push us around and send out those signals of fear or insecurity or um, mistrust and that almost provokes and brings on more, you know, we, then we just keep on living cycles based on those beliefs. Or maybe for some of us parents that were overly busy, preoccupied, you know, so when we wanted attention they kind of pushed us aside or maybe we were really neglected. What happens? There's a belief. People don't really want to be with me. Either they're not interested in me or I'm really a turn-off, but there's a belief that gets in there. And then what happens when we have that belief? Well, 
that belief creates certain behaviors that send out certain messages that we keep on recreating the past. So I often use, uh, turn to that, that quote by Gandhi and he talked about how our beliefs really create our way of um, acting and speaking and they and that ends up creating our whole character and that ends up creating our destiny. It's a, it's a um, you know, it's based on the law of karma that when this, then this. And so the sad thing is that as long as we believe our beliefs and don't investigate them, they create a reality that can perpetuate itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, the good news is that we can investigate. We can begin to challenge the storyline. And when people deepen their meditation practice, which is a practice that says, be here and see what's really going on, and I especially see this when I uh, do week-long retreats because it's more concentrative and people can end up getting to a quieter place and really see more clearly the, the nature of things. One of the reports at the end of retreats are that, it, and it's usually framed like this, I realized I didn't have to believe my thoughts. You know? Now that might sound simple, I don't have to believe my thoughts, but that is opening the gate to freedom. I don't have to believe my thoughts. Or sometimes the, the realization is I'm not my thoughts, which is a very similar experience that this world I've created, it's not, that's not who I am. You know, the I, the, the, what it, the truth is something much bigger. That self that I'm, you know, having these ongoing uh, storylines and narratives about is just a bunch of images and words that are formed from historic kind of beliefs, but there's something much more mysterious and true that's going on. I don't have to believe my thoughts. There's a Tibetan teacher that some of you met here who has been a tremendous inspiration for me, and that's Sokni Rinpoche. He has a phrase that describes this, this realization. It's real but not true. That's the way he says it. That when we have these beliefs and feelings that go with them, that's all real, meaning Yes, the belief's actually happening, and yes, the feelings are actually being felt, it's real. But it's not the truth. In other words, what its belief is, what its message is, is not truth. It's happening, but it's not the reality, the truth of what's really existing. Real but not true. So, if we're suffering, we are caught in a limiting reality, one that's real, we're experiencing it, but it's not true. Our idea is not true. It's a fragment of a larger truth. So Rumi writes about this in a few different places. I'll read a few of his um, verses. But in one place he says, he writes about this tangle of fear thinking, and he says, why do you stay in prison? when the door is so wide open. You know, if you can just see, you d I don't have to believe this. The door's already open, we don't even have to open a door. It's like we're already, there's already the truth, it's already here. It's just a realization of, oh, that story is just a story. So, tonight, uh, what this is leading to, what I'd like to explore with you is how this realization that our beliefs and emotions are real but not true can really um, allow us to walk through the prison door. And I want to say in advance that I feel like this is a, a practice that's for over the long haul. You know, we can get, we might leave here tonight with a little better of a conceptual understanding of how powerful this might be, but the more times that you catch a belief and say, wait a minute, I don't have to believe it, 
and your body kind of gets that that's true, the more you'll feel some space open up. And naturally, I'm going to ask you to choose some belief, some place you get caught to experiment with tonight. So you might be thinking about that as you listen, okay? All right, so in general, what are the, what are the kind of thoughts and beliefs that we subscribe to that create suffering? You know, just sense for yourself what comes to mind. And I'll just throw out some. For, for most of us, a kind of thought that creates suffering is, I'm bad or I'm flawed. Or even the other side, I'm superior to everybody else. I'm actually smarter, or I'm actually more ethical. Or they create separation. Any belief that creates separation is a belief that creates suffering. So what else? I'm unlovable, right? I'm unworthy. I'm unsafe. These are the kind of beliefs that keep us stuck. And they're propagated a lot through the culture. Some cultures propagate limiting beliefs more than others, I suspect. I haven't done a you know, cross-cultural comparison on this, but you can really feel it in, in cultures that have um, you know, kind of rigid religious beliefs that are um, you know, telling us that we're fundamentally impure, flawed, that we must redeem ourselves, that we're starting in the red. You know, we, we have to do things to be saved because we're fundamentally something's wrong. Well, that sets the groundwork pretty well for a lot of us, right? Remind you of one of my favorite monastery stories uh, where a monk arrives at the monastery and he's assigned to helping the other monks copy the old canons and laws of the church by hand. But he realizes they're copying from copies and he realizes that could be a problem. Because if there's a mistake in any of the copies, then they're just going to perpetuate the mistake. It's the same idea with beliefs. If we believe something and we act according to it, we're just going to perpetuate a false belief. So they're doing that with these uh, scriptures and so on. So, you know, he challenges it and the abbot says, you know, we've been copying from copies for centuries, but I'll go check it out. So he goes into the dark caves that are underneath the monastery and these are uh, the, where the original manuscripts kind of locked in a vault. It hasn't been opened for hundreds of years. Hours go by, nobody sees the abbot, so finally this young monk gets worried, so he goes downstairs and what he sees is this abbot is banging his head against the wall and crying uncontrollably. So he's, you know, father, father, what's wrong? And in a choking voice, the old abbot says, the word was celebrate. <laughs> So it's fun, but how many of us got messages and believe those messages that there's actually um, a, something dangerous about enjoying too much? You know, that if something good happens, something bad might be around the corner, so we get a little bit worried. I mean, is there these, does this make sense? That, that we're, it's not so easy just to open up to good things. We often feel I'm not deserving. Often, in some level, we feel we can't trust ourselves, we can't trust our bodies, we can't trust our sexuality, hence a lot of the religious uh, rules and regs. And in some basic way, we can't trust our aliveness, that these emotions, these passions, these feelings are not reliable, we can't listen to them. It's not okay how we are. We're flawed. So, prevents us from savoring life, these beliefs. Now, we also have beliefs that are um, perpetrated by racial, ethnic groups, those in power primarily, that cause us to hurt others. Uh, I'm thinking right now a lot of the uh, recent tragedy in the Sikh temple in Wisconsin. I spent many years with the Sikhs and uh, have a, a real sense of appreciation for uh, Sikhism and uh, and so it's more, a little more personal for me. And it's yet another example, you know, of beliefs that end up 
creating violence. And we can see it in so many places. We can see it, you know, we see it in Wisconsin. We also see when we go to war and we, our military attacks in Afghanistan and innocent civilians go and what's the reason we're there and how come we're doing this? In some way there's a creation of an evil other, a belief in a bad other that keeps us at war with each other through the centuries. It has to be there. We see in Syria the dictatorship going against its own people. You know, a bad other that warrants violent attacks. You have to have a belief like that for violence to come up in the level it does. So we have these deeply built-in notions of this is right and this is wrong and this is how people should look and this is how people should act and this is how I should be. And it's constantly moving through our brain monitoring and filtering everything that goes on, these standards and ideas. So we, we read people through this veil of, of our beliefs. Now some of you might remember this inquiry, you can imagine, and I'm bringing it in because we're about to have some elections here, that it's time to elect a new world leader, okay? And your vote counts, only your vote counts, so I want you to listen carefully. So here are the facts about three leading candidates, okay, you ready? One, candidate A associates with crooked politicians and consults with astrologists. He's had two mistresses. He also chain smokes and drinks eight to ten martinis a day. That's your first choice. Candidate B, he was kicked out of office twice, sleeps until noon, used opium in college, and drinks a quart of whiskey every evening. That's your second choice. Candidate C, he's a decorated war hero, vegetarian, doesn't smoke, drinks an occasional beer, and never cheated on his wife. Okay. So, you might feel this is a setup, but I'm going to say, <laughs> so which of, these, which of these candidates would you choose? You know, how many for candidate A? We have a few sprinkling here. How about candidate B? He's the one that was kicked out of office twice, just sleeps until noon, used opium in college, and drinks a quart of whiskey. How many? I see a sprinkling of hands. How many for candidate C, the vegetarian who doesn't smoke? I see more hands. Okay. I'm going to tell you who they are. Candidate A, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Candidate B, Winston Churchill. I didn't know he slept until noon, but I knew about the opium. <laughs> Candidate C is Hitler. Yeah. Yeah, vegetarian, right. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't want to hurt animals, you know. So here's the reason I share this. It's just that we live in a lot of assumptions that we don't challenge. You know, we, we live in the, what I call a trance of the unreal other and I'm going to be talking about this more. I have a, um, a, a night that I'm going to be really exploring this with you in September. But we live with our ideas about others, about ourselves, and about the world. And illusion can only exist until we challenge it. It can only exist until we challenge it. And if we don't, it propagates the stereotypes, not just a sense of bad self, but the stereotypes that we know so well that shame and oppress and marginalize minority people, racial, sexual, gender orientation, religion, it has us create separation and hurt others. So I'm going to give you some examples through the rest of this talk of real but not true. And the first one just to share with you is of a very dear friend who's brilliant woman, a brilliant African-American, an academic, also consulting, community activism, hung in with white institutions in terms of her schooling, her teaching, her work. And so she always had to work extra hard, you know, to get recognition and uh, working against a lot of the barriers that come with being just assumed to be an outsider. Very painful. The message that she felt like she got was basically you're less valuable and you don't belong. Just now she's, you know, because I just talked to her this week, 
she's going through another cycle of revisiting how much that message got internalized. So she became her own enemy by being in situations assuming in some way that that's what people were feeling and anticipating rejection, anticipating not being valued, having her defenses up prematurely, being angry and then actually creating the situation of being alienated. So she's owning it, she's getting that she internalized it and she's now helping to create the situations. She also gets that it is absolutely pervasive through the culture and that she, um, that she was one of the victims of that. Not in a way that, oh, I feel victimized, but an honest recognition that our culture puts down certain people. So she, her work now is um, to really bring alive this kind of practice of saying it's real. Yeah, the hurt, the feelings of being marginalized, the pain of this is real. So holding that with compassion. But it's not true that I'm unworthy. It's not true that I'm not valuable. Challenging that. And she feels like every time she goes through the cycle and she goes deeper into real but not true, she's actually able to, um, to live from a kind of confidence that attracts and that's able to communicate in, in a more clear way. Again, our beliefs create feelings. Our feelings create actions. You know, our, our action starts molding our temperament, our character. It creates a kind of karmic destiny. And we can change that. And the only place we can change our destiny is in this moment to sense the storyline going on, however we make ourselves wrong, however we make someone else wrong, and investigate. Pause and look more deeply. Okay? So the deep belief that every one of us has, and this one doesn't matter what kind of parent you had or what kind of culture you are in, the deep belief that we all have is this perception of separateness until we're really, really free. It's possible to wake up and recognize this oceanness and, and sense, oh yes, there's right now a temporary body-mind functioning, but the what I am, it, there's a timelessness too, it's possible. But for most of us, we spend a lot of life moments very identified with a separate self. That's the core belief out of which every other painful belief arises. And let me just check around, does that make sense that every other painful belief arises out of that core sense of I'm separate? That if I'm separate, then oh, I have something to fear. Others could be a threat to me. If I'm separate, oh, I'm incomplete, I'm missing something, I need this. If I'm separate, oh, other people have it better, jealous. If I'm separate, I don't have what it takes, depressed. Every emotion arises out of that pain of separation. This is Sri Narsargadatta, who's one of my favorite of the non-dual teachers. He says, As long as you imagine yourself to be something tangible and solid, a thing among things, you seem short-lived and vulnerable, and of course you will feel anxious to survive. But when you know yourself to be beyond space and time, you will be afraid no longer. So what he's pointing to is that all the real experiences we have are not true because they don't allow us to recognize that which is timeless. They keep us locked in a small separate self. They're not the truth. So we then begin to explore, is this idea and storyline of a separate self, the self-character we, you know, see going into the future that's trying to get happier and trying to feel better and trying to avoid danger, is that who we are? And is that all that we are? I mean, are you something more than this sense of a separate body-mind? 
Is there something more to what you are? It's probably the most important question we can ever ask ourselves. Because as long as all that we are, where there's an exclusive identity with this ego, personality, body, self, we're going to fear the end, fear death, we're going to feel threatened, we're not going to be able to sense our connection with others, and we're not going to be able to sense that one timeless, radiant awareness that's really animating everything. We're cut off. So how do we begin to move from a stuck place where we're buying in, we're believing our beliefs, we're believing not only am I separate, I'm bad and I'll never be loved and I'll never get what I want or whatever it is. How do we wake up from that? How do we start truly experiencing something larger? So I'll give you another um, example because the first step really is to ask yourself whenever you're suffering, just ask the question, what am I believing right now? Just ask yourself, what am I believing? And what you're really doing is you're asking the part of you that's stuck and in pain, what am I believing? the part that's afraid or ashamed, what's the view of the world through that part's eyes? 